Hi, I'm Russ Segner. We put this series together to feature narrow gauge layouts, seldom seen because they are not located in cities where we normally visit for national narrow gauge conventions. Thanks to the organizing committee of Jerry Cornwell, Pete Smith, Mark Lachey, Dave Adams, and Jeff Schultz. Information in this program is available at NNG at groups Dot io. We hope you will join us. So now for our program. I'm going to introduce our first presenter, with, who is Mike May. Uh, Mike is the Vice President and Director of Productions for Rail Events at American Health Heritage Railways, which is the owner and operator of the Durango and Silverton Railroad. Mike's responsible for the artistic and creative elements of uh, both uh, new events and, and new event planning and uh, reinventing the events across North America and UK. Before hiring to uh, Durango and Silverton in 2005, Mike worked in theater, which is his other passion, after studying theatrical lighting design at Columbia College in Chicago. So while at the uh, Durango and Silverton, he's qualified for all of the positions, it seems, including engineer, dispatcher, fireman, etc. He's also an Amtrak engineer. I didn't know that. So this guy has many, many talents, and I'm sure many of you have been reading his articles in the Gazette. So tonight he's going to present his railroad, the uh, White Pass and Yukon, and uh, I think you'll enjoy the many aspects of the layout that he's built and sharing with us tonight. So Mike, you're on. So Russ, uh, yeah, thanks for the thanks for the intro and thanks for inviting me to be a part of this. Um, my layout is the White Pass and Yukon route. It's pretty specifically, it's a model uh, Bennett, British Columbia and Skagway, Alaska, um, the uh, railroad dock area, and then a little bit of the um, Klondike Highway, which uh, crosses the railroad at Log Cabin, British Columbia. So um, I had I have one little slide here that's just kind of about myself, but um, it seems that uh, you kind of have that covered already. But yeah, so I, I've uh, been working with the Durango and Silverton Railroad for since 2005 now, so it's about 15 years, and I started as a brakeman and worked way through all that stuff. Um, I'm still qualified as a locomotive engineer, but now I run their special events company, um, Rail Events Productions, and we handle basically theatrical events on board live trains. Um, I work mostly everywhere except the Durango and Silverton with that company. We travel all over the country, so these are a couple of our events, um, Chicago Union Station, New Orleans. All that kind of stuff. So I guess what's important about that is like when I went to go build this layout, um, a lot of my background just coming from railroading professionally and narrow gauge um, and also theatrical design, I tried to meld a lot of that together and really create something that is a bit of a fusion of that, especially with the lighting design part. So, so the layout concept, I, I wanted to model um, somewhere that could be a little bit of a switching layout and I really wanted something that was different from the Rio Grande because that's uh, as much as I love the Denver Rio Grande and the RGS and Colorado and Aero Gauge I kind of live that every day so I didn't really know much about the White Pass and Yukon until I went up there in 2008 and uh, kind of fell in love with it so um, looking at the uh, different elements of the railroad I, I started with Bennett British Columbia mostly because of its it's scenery, it's a track layout. It's an interesting little location. Log Cabin's just kind of a fascinating place. It's the only highway crossing on the railroad unless you're all the way up in Whitehorse. Um, and then the railroad dock at Skagway just because I, I've always liked the marine connection to the railroad. Um, I set the layout in 1983. I did that because it gave me a little bit of creative license to change things about the prototype, though I do like to model as close to prototype as I possibly can. The railroad closed in 1982, which is, uh, so 83 gave me that license to do what I wanted. Really the idea was to build these locations. For me, you know, I like operations a lot, um, but frankly, I spend a lot of time just tinkering with it. So it's a, it's a lot, it's almost a diorama in a way as well. Um, space is of course a consideration on the layout. So really it's kind of two switching layouts. Skagway serves as one switching area, Bennett serves as a separate switching area, and then trains run between the two for operations. Just a little bit of overview of the layout itself. It's not particularly big. It's, it's a shelf. It's two foot wide, about 30 feet long. Um, it is sectional. I'll talk about that a little bit. 30 feet, um, pretty tight radius. Um, everything else is, you know, pretty normal layout construction. Modular construction, this was kind of a really big thing for me. I actually started building this layout when I lived in Chicago. I was a locomotive engineer for Amtrak for a couple of years. So when I was working there, that's when I 
on the extra board sometimes had a lot of time waiting for the phone to ring. So I started building this railroad, um, but I kind of knew that I was going to be moving. So I built it. Um, I call it modular, but it's not really, you know, it's not modular in the sense of a layout that can tour around and be set up different places, but it does come apart. My goal was that if I wanted to move it, I didn't want to have to destroy anything because I've built a few layouts before that had to get destroyed. I'm sure a lot of you on the call are um, very familiar with that sentiment. So I started with um, Bennett first, and then I built Log Cabin, and then I built uh, North Bennett, then I built Skagway. And sort of the idea was to keep doing piece by piece so that as I went, I kind of, you know, it had the satisfaction of a completed layout, but it would continue to grow. The electrical system on the layouts kind of, it's almost a sub hobby of mine, I guess I could say. I've spent a lot of time tinkering around with railroad signal equipment and that's uh, just old antique electrical has been a whole nother thing. So I've incorporated a whole lot of that into the layout. There's probably about two miles of wire underneath the railroad, even though it's only 30 feet long. So a lot of it is not necessarily, I guess you could say not necessary, um, but it's something that I've always enjoyed doing. And with that 1983 concept of being a little bit later, um, I sort of rewrote the history. The idea was that the railroad got busier instead of slower. So I incorporated a signal system, mostly because I really wanted to do it. And then uh, I did the crossing signals at Klondike Highway, which were, uh, it was never actually a protected crossing, but I decided to do that. It's done with glass relays. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later too. Lighting design, I kind of mentioned too. That's sort of another passion of mine. And that's, that's a lot of what my current job is now. I actually went to school for technical theater. So lighting's been oh gosh, part of my life since I was probably in middle school. And I knew from the very beginning that I wanted to make sure the layout um, had a theatrical system on it. I wanted to be able to recreate um, a, a day cycle with the fast clock. Um, I've had a lot of fun just uh, playing around with things that are not just, uh, you know, daylight or nighttime, but do, dealing with sunrise and sunset and all these different things, uh, kind of making it a little stylistic in a way. Um, so anyway, uh, I kind of separated this... Um, this uh, uh, slideshow into, we'll go section by section. So Bennett, British Columbia, this is the first part that I, I modeled. Um, Bennett um, in the prototype is, uh, it was the division point of the railroad or as close as you could call a division point. There was a really common operating practice way back in the day that a Canadian train would leave from Whitehorse, which is on the extreme north end and run to Bennett southbound. And then an American train would run from Skagway north to Bennett. Trains could swap crews crews go back home that night. That was kind of one of the, the ways they operated way back. Um, it's, uh, it was, I, I have to be honest that it was just, it was strikingly gorgeous the first time I ever went. So that's, that was a big piece of why I picked this location, but also with that operating system. Um, this is a photograph from, uh, I believe this is actually last year. This is pretty recent. So um, it hasn't changed a whole lot over the years. So looking at the layout, um, this is the uh, North Bennett module. So this is the far extreme end. You just kind of wide shot so you can get a little bit of an idea. It's a really shallow um, uh, photo backdrops, uh, large fascias, very clean looking. These are things that I really wanted to make sure um, as part of the layout. These are the first two modules that got built. That's um, Central Bennett and the depot, of course. Um, and then that's the south end of Bennett, which is uh, selectively compressed quite a bit, as I, you know, I think we're all used to. Um, <clears throat> the south end, I put that bridge in just because I wanted a bridge. It's not really there, but there's a lot of artistic license like that. Um, let's see. So kind of going into the concept of the layout, um, you know, I talked a little bit about lighting, but really what my goal has always been with this layout is the modeling I try to make as photorealistic as possible. Um, and I, I guess I personally, I feel like it's kind of an impossible goal, but it's a, it's kind of one of those like shoot for the stars and you hit the moon, I guess is the, the way to say it. So um, I spend a lot of time just really trying to get down close to the layout and viewing it like you would as a person if you were in miniature. Um, the layout set really high for that reason. Um, it's about uh, five, oh gosh, five foot eight, something like that. So I'm six one. It puts me at um, almost eye height to it. It's a little bit difficult to work on sometimes, but I really love looking at things not as a bird's eye view. I, I want to see it the way that it's actually um, would be if you were right there. In <clears throat> um, backdrops were really important to me too. Um, this particular photo, that's actually a test print. That's not the final backdrop, but um, the backdrop itself is a uh, photo montage of photos that I took uh, in Bennett, in Log Cabin, and then 
all over the place in Alaska, places that just kind of looked right to me, um, Alaska and British Columbia as well. So um, behind the depot here, um, that photo is actually from, uh, it's a place called Girdwood, Alaska. It's actually out over by Anchorage. So we can talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I mentioned uh, 1983 as the date. So the signal systems in there, um, the way that I incorporated the signal system is um, I, I took a ride on the Alaska Railroad a couple of years ago and was talking to a conductor just about their methods of operation. I, I thought one of the really interesting things that they do um, is they have a siding called Hurricane and it's about halfway between Anchorage to Fairbanks. It's really long siding. Um, and they have a very similar operating practice that the way the White Pass did back in the day where they would run a, a northbound and a southbound train each day and they'd usually meet at Hurricane. And so what the Alaska Railroad did is they put in a very short piece of uh, CTC or centralized traffic control um, so that when the, the trains met, as long as everything's on schedule in the middle of the winter, the crews wouldn't have to get out and shovel switches and line switches and make a meet, but you know, everything was heated and signaled and could all be controlled remotely. So I thought that was kind of an interesting modern day system. So that's, that's kind of what I based the signal system on this layout. Um, I decided that since Bennett had that similar operating practice that it would be a CTC island. So I put a control point with controlled signals on each end of the railroad. And then there's a couple of intermediate signals in between. So um, kind of an unusual, unique thing for um, uh, narrow gauge, but I thought that was kind of fun. The uh, rolling stock on the layout is always a challenge if you're a white pass modeler. Um, I don't know if there's any of you else out there, but there's very little that was produced for the for the white pass in HON3. So the locomotives are all precision scale brass. Um, they are, I've collected them over a number of years and I, I probably have too many of them now, but that's okay. Um, they're a uh, I'm always tinkering with them, trying to keep them all running as best I can, but they're all Tsunami 2 equipped. They all have sound. Um, they all uh, they all have lights. They all have, you know, all kinds of fun stuff like that. Um, again, because realism is uh, always a big thing for me. Steam locomotives, um, the White Pass had many over the years. The 70 class was their, uh, it was kind of their pride of the fleet. It was the last ones that were built. The 70 and the 71 were built about 10 years earlier than the 72 and three. The 73 is the one that they still operate today. So if I really wanted to be um, accurate with the railroad, it really should be the 73, but you know, I work around steam engines, so I, I had to have a couple of them. Um, they're, uh, they're really modern locomotives. The 73 was built in, oh, I might get this wrong, I believe it's 1948. So it's very modern for a, um, for a narrow gauge steam locomotive. The models are, um, they're uh, PFM brass from, I believe, the 1960s. Um, I could actually be wrong on that, but of course, they're all custom painted, also Tsunami 2, all that good stuff, so. Um, the Bennett Depot um, really is kind of a centerpiece of the, a big part of the layout. It's all scratch built. I was lucky enough to find blueprints of it in the archive at um, the White Pass. So I've, over the years, just especially working in the railroad industry and a little bit through being a modeler, I've, I've had the opportunity to get to know a lot of people up there. So it really helps with a, a lot of the research and getting access to documents and things like that. So. Um, they did have the blueprints um, from 1903 um, when the depot was originally built. And I, like so many other buildings, it's been changed many, many, many times over the years. So I tried to model it as close as I could to how it was in the 80s um, with a little bit of artistic license and selective compression and things like that, because it's a, it is a bigger building than um, what I could fit on, on the railroad. But the uh, front facade is almost to scale, it's very close. So if you look at it square on, it's it's got the right look for sure. Um, it's all made out of um, uh, styrene, um, a lot of titchy parts. Um, the roof, I believe it was Builders and Scale that I use their parts, um, all kinds of different details, so on and so on. So <clears throat> this is the a little bit of how I built it. These are some screenshots of the, the giant blueprints that I was able to get my hands on, but those are really helpful in, in understanding the footprint and the layout of it. So I did a CAD drawing and show on the top of the screen there um, of the model itself based on, you know, what I knew that um, the part that goes out to the back there on that, that side elevation actually should go back 
probably three times, two or three times the width that it actually does. But again, being a 12 inch wide layout, there wasn't really room for that. So some of that stuff got compressed. Um, another thing that I added to Bennett, um, I put a turntable there. Uh, there never was one. There, there is a Y and a uh, balloon loop at the actual Bennett. They, you know, they have a lot of space, obviously, because uh, that's that makes it a lot easier to put a Y in. And I didn't have the space, but I really wanted to be able to turn things. So, another artistic license choice, and I put this in. The turntable itself is, um, uh, it's actually built from a Walther's 130 foot N scale turntable that I ripped the deck off and redecked and redetailed a bunch of it. Um, but it, it was a really great starting point just because mechanically it works so well. So um, I took that and then I decided to uh, turn it into the Durango table because I needed a prototype um, since uh, working in Durango. So there's a, there's a picture with the Durango table looks like. So you can see the platform and the railings and all that. I tried to get as close as I could, but again, it's a little bit of a freelance project. So um, underneath the turntable, there's a, I did a big conversion to it because it comes with this, um, it comes with an electronic indexing system. Um, but I've always found that those indexing systems, no matter how good they are, I, I feel like you're always kind of tinkering with them and they never quite line up just right. And, you know, I thought about it and having used the turntable in Durango many, many times, um, the reality is, is the turntable doesn't index. It, it's got a lot of momentum. And when you shut the, the motor off to it or the air off or whatever, they kind of coast. So really they're kind of frustrating to get them to line up exactly how you want. So um, I decided I might as well make this a little bit more um, prototypical. And I ripped out the, all the electronics from the turntable itself in that bottom picture. That board that's in there is actually not connected to anything anymore. It's all the wires are cut. So I took the the um, the motor leads from that motor and I ran them through the um, uh, that ring kind of. I think yeah, the mouse works. So there's wipers on the bottom um, of the pit, and then I put a, a tsunami decoder under it. Um, and you just call up the turntable like a locomotive and you can throttle it back and forth. And with the tsunami motor, I use the um, steam exhaust and put a speaker down there. Um, so it mimics the, uh, the air sound of the turntable. Um, I think, I'm gonna see if this video plays. Hopefully that's not real shaky. You get kind of an idea of how, it's, uh, how it works and how it looks. Hear the air motor in there. Another thing, you know, I talked a little bit about photorealism and always striving for it. And again, I think it's a you know, uh, it's, it's a goal. It's really hard to reach, but I pay a lot of attention, um, especially when I'm up there, just looking at a lot of small details along the right of way and just things that are around, you know, I, I really try to incorporate every random little thing that I can. And I think that's a really enjoyable part of the hobby is, you know, I, I think as a lot of, you know, like that's the part that's just really never done with a, with the layout. You could, you could play around with the small details forever. So, um, things like those whistle posts, um, the switch stands, all the switch stands are animated. They're all tied into the um, tortoise switch machines on the bottom. So the targets all turn. Um, with the signal system, you can see right here, this is an electric lock box. So that wouldn't be prototypical there. But if you did have a signal system, those would be, that'd be real on a handline switch. Um, ties pedaled out from maintenance away, I Ivy kind of climbing the um, telephone poles, things like that. So. Um, I like to have a lot of fun with those sorts of things, but I use microengineering flex track. Um, I, I toyed around a lot with, um, should I hand lay or not? Um, and I have hand laid track and I really thought about it and I thought, you know, the way that the flex track is these days, I mean, I almost feel like in this scale, the detail of the spikes and tie plates and all that, it's actually better than you can achieve, better than I could achieve anyway with hand laying. So um, I've seen some beautiful stuff out there, but I, I, I decided to go this route. Um, I did go through and, and really super detail the track too, where um, every, every 33 or 39 feet, which would be the length of an actual stick of rail, I filed in a, a gap on the top of the railhead and then um, put joint bars on everything. So there's a lot of all those kind of small details added in as well. 
again, going along with the detail stuff, the, uh, the signals, they're all um, BLMA um, signals, but they were, I cut them down to um, make them seem more appropriate for narrow gauge. Cause again, there's not really a prototype, but um, I did shorten the height of the head and, and I, I played around with um, like, this one's got a really low bottom head, which is a, it's kind of a unique signal design, but it's again, something I just enjoying signals. I thought that it's a cool looking design. So I did some of those kinds of things that are, they're unusual, but again, white pass is unusual. So it seemed like it fit. Um, the uh, signal cases are important. There's uh, there's switch heaters on the layout, all that kind of stuff. Uh, anywhere there is a signal, it's all tied into the, um, to the telephone line and the code lines up there. So trying to keep it prototypical with the way that communication all works. Kind of continuing on with details. This is one of my, probably one of my favorite pictures of the layout. Um, but that bridge, um, while it's not actually a bridge that exists in that location, another thing that I was happy to find from some sources at White Pass was the uh, standard drawings for all of their timber trestles back in um, when the railroad was built. So they don't build them like this anymore, but they would have existed this way in the 80s. A lot of that stuff was replaced later on. So um, the timber trestle is actually built, you know, correct dimensional, the bent shape is correct and all those sorts of things. Um, even though this is a not, not a particular prototype, but I really try to get you know down to the nut bolt washer castings. The stringers have a, they're gouged out for every tie. Um, just junk from old wrecks under the under the bridge. There's some coupler knuckles down there, barrels, blah blah blah. This is the initials of a friend of mine who helped build the layout. Um, I scratched them into the bridge. Just a little bit of graffiti, things that you you know. I think don't get modeled often, but we find in real life all the time. This is uh, South Bennett. So this is the other control point. Again, just kind of going along with a lot of the detail and stuff that I do. I, I did uh, dwarf signals here. Just again, it's something I thought was, I think they're neat. Um, they're not totally typical, but why not? Another thing that the dwarf signals allowed me to do too, is they're really easy to hide. So if I want to, um, if I want to do photography on the layout and not have it have a signal system. It's really easy to just put like a shrub or a rock or something in front of that. And all the, uh, the modern stuff that isn't prototypical just kind of disappears. So keeping that low profile is kind of a, a neat little feature of going that route. Rolling stock on the layout, uh, the White Pass has, so they have a lot of equipment that was um, shop built or weirdly customized. They have a lot of equipment that came up during World War II from other narrow gauge railroads. Um, and then later on, they built a lot of equipment when they started getting busy and, and quote, modernizing, like in the, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So um, these cars, the 300 series container flats, um, they built 200 of them um, in 1969, I believe. They were a very, very common car at the end of the, end of the line. So when, they, um, when the railroad started shipping ore by container and they started shipping dry goods by um, 25 foot containers, that's when they have these all custom built. They're designed so that they can carry um, a white pass 25 foot container, or a lot of them were then modified because 25 foot never became a standard internationally. Um, they were modified to have container cones to carry a 20 foot container as well. Then they also could carry the even shorter um, ore containers that stayed captive on the white pass. So. Um, this is one of the models of them that I built, and I've, there's actually several of them on the layout. The car itself is, uh, it's built with 3D printing, so it was a, it's a, it was an interesting project for me. It was the first time I kind of really dove into that, but um, I did a lot of research, a lot of measurements, um, got some really great materials from up there, a lot of photographs, and um, drew this all into um, AutoCAD. And then any of the details that I didn't think would be able to print um, successfully they were too small I just cut them off from the car and added them as details later on so like the stirrup steps the uh, the grading all the air brake equipment those are all later added detail parts so it's kind of a fun project um, this is another really unique car that they had that I decided I had to model because it's so white pass but um, they took a 1100 series flat car which are I believe they're 40 feet and they extended this one out to 53 feet um, so that they could carry these 80 foot pipe sections on it. And you can imagine an 80 foot pipe section going down a narrow gauge railroad. It's, it's quite a sight to see. Um, they had this uh, contract that they were gonna bring 
oh god i, I don't even want to know miles and miles and miles of this pipe up to whitehorse for a pipeline so they spent a bunch of money and did this test construction and this is actually the only car they ever built so it made one test run from um, skagway up to whitehorse and then they tied it down and I don't know if it ever came back to be totally honest. I've never been able to confirm that. So the pipeline project obviously didn't happen, which is why the, this went away, but I had to build, build it anyway. Cause it's, it's such a unique car. I'm honestly a little bit shocked. It makes it around curves and things, but uh, anyway, there's, there's that. Another thing that they, they inherited a lot of cars during uh, world war II, like I mentioned. So these cars um, came from the Sumter Valley railroad. Um, there were the turtleback cars with those the really archy arching roofs there you can see one of the the really arched roofs here on a neighboring car this one the 211 um was damaged in uh, um the roundhouse fire uh in 69 so it's uh its roof ended up getting replaced with a slightly different profile but these cars were they're on like every train you find pictures of in the 80s they they were definitely a favorite um the cupolas were added by the White Pass. Um, that was a thing that White Pass did to a lot of their passenger cars over the years too, um, when they would run uh, mixed trains. So they ran these, uh, it was basically a coach and with the cupola for the freight section. So this is still kind of a work in progress, but I thought I'd throw that picture in there anyway. Um, these are totally scratch built. The roof itself is uh, also a 3D print. It's a 3D resin print. Uh, log cabin, British Columbia, just kind of moving down the layout. Um, log cabin, there is almost nothing there. There was a section house at one point, which is a future project for me to build. Um, the neat thing about log cabin, though, it's where the Klondike Highway crosses the railroad. So it seemed like a cool little feature for me. I kind of an aside here, I did this, this uh, fire scene sort of between log cabin and Bennett. Um, I threw that in there because my dad's a wildland firefighter. So it's a little bit of a I don't know, an ode to him or whatever. And I've, I've always had a fascination with helicopters. So it seemed like a great way to add something there. Um, the helicopter itself is just a plastic kit, but it's, uh, it's all custom, custom painted and everything to be uh, Canadian search and rescue. So this is down in um, log cabin itself, just a couple clicks down the track. Um, the highway crossing there on the left. Um, again, I think I mentioned that they never had signals there, but going with that whole, uh, just the, it, wanting to add electronics and fun things like that and again modernizing the railroad i thought that it would make sense that they would have put crossing signals in there eventually at some point of course even today they still don't have any up there but that's all right um, i did take a little bit of artistic license here and i moved the siding from the uh, north end of the crossing to the south end it's just the way that the uh, space on the the layout itself worked out so it's a little bit inaccurate but that's okay i think that's kind of something we all do I think another thing I just wanted to point out real quick on this slide is um, one of the things that I think I mentioned, I, I really try to keep like clean fascias and um, keep everything almost looking like furniture, I guess you could say, you know, I, I, I've always admired layouts that look sort of like a museum exhibit, you know, and, and I'll, I've definitely built the other kind too. This is, <laughs> this is the first time I've had a layout that um, I feel like the goal is if somebody who doesn't understand model railroading comes and looks at it, it should look like a finished thing. Like we're all good at looking at benchwork and envisioning what it's going to look like. Um, but I, I, I always wanted to strive to make it look like a finished product, even if you know that it's not quite done yet. So I guess again on that, you know, just uh, putting the station names on there and again, keeping it clean. Um, everything on the railroad is DCC controlled. So there's very little on the fascia. Even turnouts are all um, on switch decoders. Anything that is on the fascia is something that an operator would have to interact with an actual physical thing in the field, I guess you could say. So like these radio buttons, you push it and you can use, there's a phone right down here. It's barely out of the picture, but um, you can talk to the dispatcher that way. So this is the Klondike Highway um, on the layout. Um, the highway itself, um, it's Alaska 98, which is named for the 1898 gold rush, which is why all of this is up there. Um, and when it gets into Yukon, it's Yukon 2, and it runs, oof, I might, I might lie about this, but I think it runs several hundred miles north into almost no man's land. Um, it didn't exist until 1978, so it was... Um, not really part of the downfall of the railroad necessarily, but um, it was in a shift of the transportation, you know. Backdrops here uh, are actually photo backdrops of um, standing in the middle of the crossing looking at the exact hillside. So 
that's a wide shot from the day that I actually shot those photographs. Uh, yeah, you could see you can see how close that is. So trying to keep it realistic. The crossing itself. So this is the this is my signal case. Um, this is directly underneath the crossing. This again is going to that electronics hobby, but these are all actual railroad signal relays um, from General Railway Signal, which is the um, um, of the tiny bit of signal equipment that did exist on the White Pass. Um, they were all GRS products. So I decided I should, if this were to exist, it would have to be GRS. I modeled everything on this based on the 32nd Street crossing on the Durango and Silverton. So it's almost a wire for wire um, copy. I just organized it. So I, it's a little bit of a cleaner installation, I guess. So this is the 32nd Street crossing on the railroad. You can kind of see the similarity. Here's a video of it. So scenery on the layout, that's another thing, uh, kind of goes with details and photo backdrops and things, you know, trying to be as realistic to um, what it looks like up there. There's definitely, for anyone who's been up there, uh, the northern part of British Columbia and southern Yukon, it, it really has a look kind of of its own. It's really mountainous. And on the south end, when you get towards White Pass and to Skagway, it's actually rainforest by technical designation. The amount of rain that it gets there from uh, being on the Pacific coast is is quite a lot so that everything is moss covered and it's very moist and all that if you come north on the railroad then you get into it's much more typical mountainous it doesn't get a whole lot of rain it gets a whole lot of drifting snow in the winter time um, and then you go a little bit further north to car cross which is actually technically a desert so you're on this weird like um change in like natural moisture um, so the, the plants that grow up there in the really short growing season, it's, it's kind of unique. So it really does have a look of its own. Uh, I guess an interesting little side note on this picture, this was taken again with the mock-up backdrop. It's, you can see it's all in black and white, but uh, that is how the final printed. But I, I printed these all out just in, on cheap paper to save money um, and hung them and, and cropped things and changed it and, and spent a lot of time in Photoshop um, with a good friend of mine who's whose Photoshop skills are not uh, forgotten on this layout. So here's a couple of pictures of just my process of building. Um, I know we all do this similar, but different too. So um, everything on the layout's just open grid bench work and plywood under the tracks. Um, in a really not prototypical thing, I, I decided that the layout would have no grades at all. It just made more sense for the module system. So um, everything's just on three quarter inch plywood. So it would be, really solid cork um, flex track is all glued down with silicone adhesive and then pink foam board and then I just use joint compound on top of the pink foam board and I put it on really real thick let it dry let it crack put on a whole bunch more let it dry let it crack until I get a pretty good smooth surface and then I'll just go and sand it um, pretty roughly and then do one more thin layer to get like a final final base coat but I just found it's it's cheap and easy and it's durable and I've done it on a lot of layouts over the years and it, it seems to work really well. So the next thing I do is uh, I put down uh, the base coat of scenery, just the ground covers. Um, the highway is uh, also finished on this and painted. Um, I try to make a point that when I do scenery, I always go in the order of the way nature would work. So you would have uh, you'd have the track in place, right? And then and then ballast would end up going on top of all of the greenery. So I would always, I always ballast the track after I put the base coat of scenery down, but then there's always going to be some like vegetation that crawls up the ballast. So I'll always go back in and then do second layers of things. So I, I feel like that it, there's probably a million ways to do it, but that's the process that I've always followed to try to recreate nature the best I can. Um, this is a, actually a good picture showing all the uh, joint bars too. So Track then gets airbrushed before it, I airbrush it before I ballast, of course, um, but then I'll ballast it and then I go back and I airbrush it again. So one of the things I noticed in all these photographs of uh, White Pass stuff from back in the day and even kind of now, I don't think they ran their uh, regulator through it all that often. So the locomotives and the cars would drip oil in the center of the track. So all of their track is like just very stained black down the middle. Um, so I tried to recreate that. So that's again, like, you know, every, the track's all weathered, then it's ballasted, weathered again, try to achieve those things. Um, here's just a couple of scenery comparisons. So again, like I was saying that, like, you know, it's kind of a unique look. It's, it's a lot of this, um, 
a lot of limestone and granite. The the ground cover sort of creeps around and it's it's almost tundra y. So I tried to recreate that as best I can with matching the colors of the gravel and matching the colors of the ground turf and all those sorts of things. So um, it's a couple of comparison photographs there. Um, again, a few more comparison photos. These are all photos I took when I was up there at the same season that I'm trying to model here. So bring them back and take them to hobby shops. And if you can find a hobby shop and then <laughs> try to find comparable scenery materials. This picture with the van crossing the, uh, the bridge there, again, that's, it's meant to be modeled here in this, uh, this area of um, uh, Bennett, even though it's not an actual place. So the uh, lighting and the backdrop, I try to match those the best I can in times too. Of course, the downside of the backdrop is it can't change. So like I said, that would be really cool, wouldn't it? If you could do back, backdrops that are all done with video or something like that. So you can change them with the seasons and time of day. But anyway, that's, uh, you know, it's overcast looking. So I try to match that overcast in the lighting. This is that fire scene I was talking about. I used to do this because my dad's a firefighter, you know, and I wanted to make something that's, of course, realistic um, to the best I could. Um, I think it came out pretty okay. One of the things I've noticed is that, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people try to model fire and sometimes it works great and sometimes it's, it just doesn't. But, I, you know, I thought about it more and I feel like a big piece of it that doesn't scale is flame and smoke. Like they don't, there's no way to shrink that down unless, I mean, no way that I know of anyway. So what I decided to do is model it as a, as a, uh, a mop-up effort. So it's already burnt out, but they're just, uh, they're cleaning up what's left of it. So uh, it's again, I, I use a lot of real materials. So it's actual ash from uh, just from a fire pit in the backyard. And then a lot of black paint on top of uh, ground turf. And then more, more ground turf on top of that, more weathering with different colors of grays. And I do a lot of layers. Um, I don't, there's never one finished version of it. So again, the helicopter, I think I mentioned that a little bit. It's just a, um, gosh, a ROCO model, I believe. It's the UH-1D Iroquois. It's a common helicopter of the era. Um, Canada actually did have a couple. So the Bambi bucket down here, the water bucket, that was a scratch built project. It's actually made out of a wire nut that I carved out. So um, after trying to figure out how to do that for a really long time, I just saw a wire nut sitting on the workbench and thought, huh, that might work. I try to, like the fire crew, I, I try to build these little scenes too. And sometimes they get changed around the layout here. But, you know, I guess you could come up with a million stories of what's going on here. But the Maybe the conductor got out of the van to go talk to the rail fans in the car or something like that. So I try to make things that you can imagine like what might be going on. Again, it's just, it's all about realism to me. This is another, uh, this is just next to the log cabin side. And it's honestly kind of a favorite photo location. I, I feel like it, I can do a lot with it. It's, it's pretty open. It takes on a lot of different looks. So just included that because I liked it. So moving on to Skagway, this is where we cross from my layouts, where we cross into the United States. Of course, that's really at the summit of White Pass. The only part, well, not the only part, but the iconic part of the railroad that I didn't model because it'd be hard to do modularly is um, actually coming down from the summit where there's, you know, the, the railroad's about 600 feet or so above the river at most times. So I skipped over that and we just go straight on to Skagway because again, I was really interested in all these little scenes. So here's an overall picture of um, the module. Um, the Skagway module is, um, it's the most removable. Uh, I did that because it, it actually sits on the kitchen counter when I want to operate it. So most of the time it's, it's just up in storage, um, but it's easy to take down and it's just a couple of bolts and it, you know, clamps right onto the layout. So that's it sitting in storage right now. Coming, this is a, this would be a train that's northbound leaving Skagway, but there's a really cool section of track um, in downtown Skagway that's between the cliffside and downtown. And it's almost like, it's like this really wooded secluded, you would, you would never know it's there, but it's, it's probably the busiest piece of the railroad because it goes between the shops and the yards and down to where all the docks are. So it's a place that I've always liked to just wander back there and watch trains during the day. So that's what I was trying to capture here, where it's just kind of going through the woods. Uh, it's kind of weirdly flat, but you can you can see the uh, remnants of the dockway in the back there. So this is the railroad dock, which is one of three docks that the White Pass um, operates there in Skagway. This is the oldest. Um, the railroad dock was the original. Skagway is definitely something where I had to use a lot of selective compression. It's uh, Oh God, the dock itself can fit two very large cruise ships. So it's, it's really long. Uh, mine's about five feet of dock or so. So 
Um, I took a lot of the details and just a lot of little scenes that I enjoyed and, and um, combined them into a uh, one look. This like this little boathouse down here. This doesn't exist anymore, but I found it in this um, very old picture. I just liked it. You can see it's removed here. And um, this is a photograph that's of my era. That's probably the late 70s. Yeah, I just I, I thought it was pretty neat. So I put it in there. So I do a lot of that kind of thing, as long as it has a, a reason or a purpose, you know, that I'm, I'm cool with the um, artistic license. The uh, White Pass, uh, I, I kind of touched on this a bit, but it's it was known as the uh, the container route. Um, and they the railroad does have, uh, it takes a lot of credit for really starting intermodal transportation. Um, the four was a standardized thing around the world. They, you know, I, I think a lot of railroads and a lot of companies figured out the idea of taking a box and putting it on and off a trailer or something like that, you know. Um, but White Pass was the first one to really truly do it as an intermodal transportation. And they had rail cars custom built for their containers. They also had trucks custom built for their containers, which they operated out of Whitehorse. And they were the world's first um, purpose built container ship it was actually owned by the White Pass and Yukon. Over the years, they had the first one. And then, I, oh gosh, I think they had three more. I think there were four total. It could have been three total. I might be lying about that, but. That's something that I honestly haven't integrated a whole lot, but I've been working on, you know, more and more of that whole container service because it, it was such an important part of um, uh, the railroad's history. Just kind of going back to a little bit of details to like this uh, backdrop for this photograph is not actually, um, it's not really there. Um, it's just, I have a couple of different chunks of backdrop that are laminated onto some uh, sheets of foam core and I use them for a different photography like this. Like there should be a kitchen cabinet behind it there, but you know, for a temporary setup, it works. Just a, a really quick note, this uh, car back here, this is one of my favorite prototypes on the railroad, um, on the layout rather. It's, um, they called them the jumbo tanks, the jumbo tanks. Um, and they're X Rio Grande standard gauge, 11,000 gallon UTLX tank cars. I don't know why they thought that they'd be why they would work, but somehow they do. So they, they bought them, they brought them up and they put narrow gauge trucks under them. And they're, they're absolutely massive on narrow gauge, but I think they're, they're just kind of cool looking. So I had to build a couple of those. Um, that sort of gives you an overall view of the entire railroad. This is a, this is a picture quite some time ago now, but um, it shows the backdrop in a very early stage of trying to understand the geometry at all of it all. But uh, I guess the, the neat thing about this, you can tell it's not actually all that big of a model railroad. There's a whole lot going on and not too much space. So, um, Operations, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, a big part of the railroad is really just about having these different scenes because um, I tinker with it a lot. But being a railroader myself, I did want to make it so that it is actually operable. And I wanted to be able to have operating sessions. So I thought about that from the beginning. When we do run it, it's uh, three crews and a dispatcher. There, I built a dispatcher's office on the in the second floor in a, the closet of a spare bedroom. So... Uh, communications uh, phone line system as it would have been back before the radios. Um, the way I run it is there's a, basically there's a switch crew in Bennett and a switch crew in Skagway. And I say it's the, uh, the Canadian local came down from Whitehorse and they're the ones switching out Bennett and then Skagway has always got a yard job. And then there's a local train that runs between the two and shuttles cars and also handles anything that's going on at log cabin. Um, I use a car card system, um, nothing too fancy there. Um, and then I use uh, OCS clearance forms or centralized traffic control for the crews to get over the territory. OCS is basically, it's a, um, it's a track warrant. It's just the Canadian version of the same. It's a quick little shot of an operating session there, pre-backdrop. So this one, this one goes back quite a few years now. Phone line goes to the dispatcher's office, which is above and to the right in this photo. And that's a schematic of the layout itself. This is what the dispatchers use. So these are all these are all known locations that are actually modeled. There's actually mile posts here. So you can issue authority to run between any of these different particular spots. There's the uh, dispatcher's office. Um, it's totally freelance, but just based on, you know, a lot of photographs of different dispatch offices that I've seen. The control machine is kind of the centerpiece. It was built by a friend of mine in uh, Michigan. Uh, Mike Burgett, who is an amazing CNO layout, but he's a he's a signal engineer and builds these things custom for a lot of different model railroads. And a lot of the parts are um, salvaged old US and S parts, um, but things like the track diagram are obviously custom built, and um, all the lights are converted to LEDs in it, so it, it has the right look, but it's uh, it's a little bit easier to integrate into the signal system. So that's a friend of mine, Steve, dispatching the railroad. He's actually a dispatcher on the White Pass, so that was kind of a fun operating session. 
just to give an idea what an OCS clearance form, it's uh, a little bit like a, uh, it's very much like a track warrant, which is a modern version of a train order. So um, I base these forms on what the White Pass actually uses with a couple of tweaks just to make it a little bit cleaner for the model railroad. We made these uh, record of train movements uh, dispatcher sheet. Um, these were totally custom made by another friend of mine, but it's again based on a White Pass sheet. It's based on a Durango and Silverton sheet, and it's also based on a U.S. Army sheet that was used up there. So kind of took the parts of it that I liked the best and came up with that. Um, so this is kind of a fun thing. Another modeler friend of mine started doing on his layout, but uh, one of the things we never really model in operations, I feel like, is brake tests. And brake tests on the prototype is certainly when you discover all kinds of things that change your day real big. The way we do this is uh, when a train's about to leave, a, leave the terminal and it's going to head to the other yard, um, you have to draw one of these cards from a deck. So most of them say test passed, but I put a couple of the bad ones here and they give you instructions that if something doesn't pass the brake test, you either, you know, you might have to set something out or you might have to uh, just wait a certain amount of time as if something were being repaired. So kind of a unique little operating thing that probably could work on a whole lot of layouts. So. Onto the lighting system a bit here. This was, uh, again, like I talked about, um, something I wanted to integrate from the very beginning. So um, it's mostly theatrical fixtures. It's LED and halogen. Um, all the lights on the layout in the buildings are all controlled by a uh, theatrical LED controller. And I run it as a 24 hour cycle. It matches the fast clock of the layout. Um, and then I did the Northern Lights with um, a video projector. So a couple of the lighting fixtures that I use. Um, it's a uh, pretty common stuff in theater, nothing terribly expensive really, um, but it's equipment that I was used to. Here's what it looks like above the layout. So there's there's about 50 lights that are above the 30 feet of railroad. So it's it's kind of a lot for what it is, but again, it's, it's sort of a whole second hobby of mine. Um, more of the lighting equipment up there. That's the video projector for the Northern Lights. Um, that's the dimming system. So those take um, a, uh, it's called a DMX 512 signal. It uh, comes out of the lighting software. Um, and then everything's plugged into here and you've um, full dimming control remotely from the computer. That's the a screenshot of the software that I use. It's, it's a software called CamSys, but again, this is meant for controlling lights in a theater, really. The uh, lighting on the layout, like I said, is a 24 hour cycle. So a lot of it is um, daylight. I, I kind of run a, a longer day than you should just because it's easier to operate with daylight. Um, it's not as pretty, but you know, it's easier. So I try to mimic uh, the lighting of daylight as best as I can, where it's not just, um, um, I feel like a lot of layouts end up looking like it's a really cloudy day, like everything's very soft, you know, but really the sun casts some really harsh shadows. Um, another thing that I, I always enjoy too is it's not ideal for photographs all the time, but I really like, um, like strong backlight and side light because a lot of times, you know, we're not in the ideal location when we're just looking at reality, um, the not, not the perfect place to take a photograph. So it, we don't always see that perfect, like the lit side of an engine. So I try to model that. Kind of getting into the sunset, this again, just using those high, high steep angles and things, a lot of deep colors, but trying to keep it realistic. There's a lot of shade down here, you know, when the sun's low on the horizon, the shadows become more pronounced. So I try to pay attention to a lot of those things. Um, Another thing I like to play around with is color temperature. Um, there's a lot in photography too, just mimicking the look of uh, like older photographs that may have faded a bit and, you know, getting those like sort of brighter yellows and um, not so realistic, but I think it's a really neat image. So I've always liked that too. This is again, like a, a very late like sunset, you know, the lights coming from behind the locomotive and there's just very cool light to the front. Again, the colors are a little bit saturated, but you know, it's, it's maybe a little bit more fanciful than realistic, but it's some, I've always enjoyed it. So, um, night lighting is something that I've, I've always tried to uh, get as best as I can. Even when I'm a lighting designer in a theater, I, I always try to strive for night lighting that looks real. Um, the challenge obviously is that night isn't actually blue, night is dark. The only way you can replicate it in a way that we can actually see is going with cool colors because that is what's most pronounced in night lighting. So um, I play around with a lot of color um, and trying to find blues that don't read as just royal blue, but maybe rather as just cold. Um, I use a lot of blue that has a lot of red in it, which seems counterintuitive, but bringing the red content up also helps the, um, the ability to photograph. So like this yellow, you wouldn't be able to see the yellow at all if it was just straight blue light. So 
Um, I mean, that's a whole another conversation, but um, yeah, there's a whole lot of art to the night lighting. I think it was one of my favorite um, night lighting photographs. So I'm trying to capture that sort of moonlit look. Again, being a little bit theatrical, um, this only works in a photograph. The headlight on the model is not nearly that bright. So that's a, that's a separate light stage just for the photo, but I love playing around with that kind of stuff. Again, Skagway at night, um, moonlight reflecting off the water. It's a very high color temperature, high backside light to try to replicate moonlight with the um, sodium vapor street lights. They're color corrected down to actually match the color of a sodium light. There's the dock again. Interior lights, uh, making sure color temperatures are correct and levels are correct so that the buildings don't light up as if there's, you know, the sun is inside, like, but, you know, maybe it was only a desk lamp or something. So I try to pay a lot of attention to that. So the other really cool thing I integrated here is the, uh, the Northern Lights. Having been up to Alaska a bunch of times in the North in general, the Northern Lights, I think, are one of the coolest things that anybody could witness. So um, I had to figure out a way to do it. Um, the way that it's done here, it's... Um, their video projected and it's actual video of the Northern Lights in real time. And it gets a little complicated, but I made a video of masks so that it, it blacks out the video where it should be on the mountains. Um, so the Northern Lights only exist in the sky above the mountains. It's a pretty cool effect, but it's, it's pretty cantankerous to be totally honest. So I'm always kind of tinkering with it, trying to make it better. This is a, it honestly, the video of it's not really great just because it is dark, but and this kind of gives you a little bit of an idea what it looks like when it's happening. It's a lot more vibrant in person, so. Still a cool effect though. I mean, it's it's so iconic of the North Country, so I couldn't, couldn't resist by having it. Um, just a couple little videos here. Hopefully these, yeah, they're gonna be pretty spotty. And that's, uh, that's the end of my little presentation. So I just, I'll put a little shameless plug on there too. There's a Facebook group for the layout. If anyone wants to see more pictures, you're more than welcome to uh, join it. So there you have it. Thanks everyone. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Uh, we're going to be pressed for time here, but uh, you can hang around at the end of the show, I think. And we perhaps yeah. have some questions and answers then. You bet. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Sorry if I went long. Well, no, no. <laughs> this is hard to stop watching. <laughs> really, I guess that's a good problem. <laughs> so I want you to come over and help me rewire my layout. Okay. <laughs> uh, Happy to do so. Very good. Okay. Uh, were there any urgent questions, guys, that you picked up? Okay. Lo loved it. That's all I can say. All right. Thank you again, Mike. Mike, I have a question for you. Above, above the dock in Skagway, there is a uh, fairly large gold mine. Do you model that one at all? I never have, no. No? No. It's, it's, I know what you're talking about, but yeah, I, I, maybe someday. It's on the list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just Mike, Mike what, what rail weight do you use? Um, so that's a good question. So it's, uh, the layout is, it's got code 40, 55 and 70. Um, and I actually don't like the 70, um, in HON3, cause I think it looks way too big, but frankly, the white pass is at the end, it was laid in 115 pound rail. So it actually scales out correctly. Wow. So 
it, I think it still looks a little bit weird, but it looks weird when you look at the prototype too. So it, it scales right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Great show. Great show. Okay. Mike, tell them about 107 running today. Oh, sure, Jerry. <laughs> um, just kind of a little aside before I won't take up too much time, but we took the, uh, I don't know if you know that the, uh, a couple of the White Pass locomotives got purchased by the Durango and Silverton and we had our first actual commissioning successful test run of locomotive 107 um, all the way up to Cascade with a load behind it today. So that, that was pretty exciting. I actually, I got back here about 10 minutes before this whole thing started. So I was, I was racing from the roundhouse back here to do this tonight, but yeah, it was pretty neat. I'm sure Jerry will post all kinds of pictures of that. <laughs> Mike, there was a question asked about your uh, layout or about the uh, the railroad. Do you have the uh, hot box detectors? I don't believe the prototype ever had any. Um, I could be wrong on that, um, but I did actually model one um, and it, it didn't make it into the presentation at all, but it, it runs through uh, JMRI. When you trigger a track circuit and you go past the hotbox detector, it will play back a, a, a random generated message, um, kind of like the kind of like the air brake test cards where there most of them are no defects, but every now and again, it does give you a defect. So any update on uh, the operation at uh, Durango in terms of uh, your test today with the locomotive and any other issues that you want to bring us up to date on? Um, gosh, that's a, I mean, that, yeah, there's, there's a lot to talk about there, but I mean, in brief, we're just kind of, you know, with, with COVID and everything, we're taking it a little bit of a week at a time. We're certainly planning on having a summer season at this point, um, but, you know, time could, time could change that. So um, the roundhouse is real busy right now getting, getting everything ready so that we can be ready to operate. We are operating winter trains right now, actually more than we have in the past. Um, so things are looking good. Um, running weekends right now and should be running um, seven days a week starting in March and opening to Silverton around May 1st. I had a question for Mike. What are those two diesels that don't have trucks on them in the yard? I saw those when I was passing through Durango. They are, um, they're custom built. Um, they were, I don't honestly know a whole lot about them. Um, they're cut down EMD parts for the most part, and it's got a Caterpillar engine in it, and they're, uh, the trucks are not delivered yet, so that's why they're up on blocks right now. Um, but the trucks should be here. Oh, gosh, I don't know. It's, uh, it's So much of that has to do with how just trucking and shipping and COVID and everything's kind of a mess. And honestly, they won't probably get commissioned until the fall anyway, since the White Pass units went into service first. Um, and frankly, we don't need like an entire fleet of diesels. We just need a couple for work trains and things. So we're probably going to back burner those for a minute. I got a question. I was fascinated by the telephone poles and the telephone lines. Could you tell us how, what did you use for the telephone lines? Poles are all uh, ricks um, with a lot of added detail and insulators cut off so that I got the actual insulator pattern. And let me see. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm sitting at the workbench right now. This is this is the line. It's easy line. Um, you can get it from a lot of different places, but uh, it's by Berkshire Junction, and it comes in a couple colors and a couple sizes. Um, and what's really cool about it is when you when you put it on, it'll stretch like ten times its its uh, actual length. Um, so I put it on and I stretch it to maybe you know, double its length or something like that. So you, it's nice and taut. Um, but if you bump it, it won't break. You can, I mean, you can put your hand on it and it, it's got plenty of stretch left. So um, yeah, I just wire it through and little drops of um, super glue to hold it to the insulators. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We hope you enjoyed this. We look forward to seeing you again. The next session will be posted on the group's I-O-N-N-G, several days before the next program. Look for the link there.